That's why we're doing today's radio show, because we're going to tell you what's happening here. The group of young men you see over there on Camelback and 19th Avenue are the Hebrew Israelites, sometimes called the black Hebrew Israelites, although they, they don't like that term, so we're not going to call them that today. The Hebrew Israelites, and there's a great article on them coming out. This uh, An article this in-depth has never appeared in Christian print that I'm aware of as far as a periodical. And the Christian Research Journal, which you can sign up for and subscribe to at urbantheologianradio.com, there's a discount right there on the front page. There's an article coming out uh, pretty soon called The Origin and Insufficiency of the Black Hebrew Israelite Movement. To talk about that article today, I'm speaking with the author of said article, Jimmy Butts, hailing from Louisville, Kentucky. What's up, Jimmy? How you doing? Welcome to Koinonia. Hey, man. What's going on? All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the main points of the article here with you, including the origin and maybe some reasons why this group even exists. Let's look at that real quick. Why do you think there's even such a thing as what some people might call black Judaism or black Hebrew religious movements? What's maybe a plausible explanation for this type of thing existing? What do you think, Jimmy? Yes, well, one thing I try to unfold in this article is to say that a good look at African American uh, church history and theology will give us some keen insights into this very topic. And so when you look at African American, the history of African American theology, you recognize that there has been a theme that emphasizes the Exodus. Um, when African slaves first encounter the, the literature of the Bible, um, they were attracted to the idea or excuse me, the story of the Exodus and Moses, because for obvious reasons, they were enslaved. Uh, the people in the Exodus were enslaved, enslaved. And so uh, gradually, when, when you look at the history of African-American thought, uh, you see this, this gradual uh, switch from a symbolic identification saying that we are like the children of Israel into, at least in certain strands, we are the children of Israel. All right, so a lot of people have perhaps heard what are called sometimes Negro spirituals, and a yes. lot of them, like you just said, have these themes of of the Exodus and, and redemption and things like that. Let me mm-hmm. play people a, a clip of what I mean. For example, Louis Armstrong, "Go Down Moses." Well, that is tight. Come on. Name of this is Go Down Moses, and it's the Louis Armstrong. Israel was in Egypt land. Let my people go. You can sing along if you want out there now. Press so hard they could not stand. Let my people go. So the Lord said, go down. All right, I'm going to let that play in the background. So you see this in a lot of the spirituals. And it makes sense because the Israelites were slaves under bondage, under wicked rulers. And the slaves, of course, rightfully so, felt similar, right? So that was a sort of a symbolic identification. You know, God has freed slaves before. He has an interest in the oppressed. He always rights wrongs. So it makes sense why this would be a key theme, maybe more so than, uh, you know, white brothers and sisters in America because uh, they don't have the same experience, you know. They, they weren't forcefully kidnapped from Europe. They came over here on their own free will. So you could see that motif. Now, what do you think happened with the Hebrew Israelite movement, though, Jimmy Butts? 
it? Yeah. So, well, we see that, as I said, that this idea of uh, symbolic identification switching over into a literal identification. So around the beginning, excuse me, the end of the 19th century, you begin to see local congregations spring up uh, that would identify as Israelites. Um, so, for example, uh, a gentleman by the name of Frank Cherry uh, begins going around and, and, and claiming that he's re he's received revelation, telling him that African Americans are the true Israelites. Uh, and you also see this well, with just um, so everyone knows, church. they actually established a church called the Church of the Living God, the pillar ground of truth for all nations, out of Chattanooga, Chattanooga uh, Tennessee, there in 1886. So that gives you an idea of when this stuff popped off. What's another old school Hebrew Israelite movement there, Jimmy? Yeah, so you have another gentleman uh, right around that time by the name of William S. Crowdy. Uh, and he also claims that he received revelations saying that the African Americans were the true Hebrew Israelites. And, right. so, and that's a, they, he also started a congregation, in case anybody's wondering. And that one is called the Church of God and Saints of Christ. began in 1896 in Kansas. So that's back in a day with the movement. But a lot has changed since then. And part of it has been because of YouTube. Mm -hmm. Since then, this this idea really spreads orally. It's it's you see it in text, you see it in print. Don't get me wrong, but it's not primarily, I don't think, a textually driven belief system like maybe in the way Jehovah's Witnesses are. Yeah, they do door to door, but they're big on literature, big on literature. I'm not saying the Hebrew Israelites don't have you know websites and stuff, but I'm saying YouTube is a key way. And the past ten to twenty years, especially the past five years mm -hmm. this thing is blowing up in the cities and on the internet the idea that hey if you came over here in a slave ship it's highly likely that you're one of the lost tribes of israel which aren't really lost you just have not been told your true identity so wake up what else do you want to add about that general thesis or general motif so people can understand the background of the hebrew israelite theology yeah well i mean if, if you just think about this idea of the Exodus story and that attraction that many African Americans have to it, it, it gives them some type of frame of reference to uh, piece together their experience. Uh, a kind of theodicy or um, an explanation of some of the injustices that they're going through. And so they'll see in the scriptures that, you know, hey, well, God allowed his people to go through enslavement at this time. So therefore, we see that there's not a contradiction between having a good God uh, and enduring suffering. And so I think that this causes a lot of people to attract to this idea because it helps them understand their experience. And so the basic idea that they would have is, hey, if you read Deuteronomy 28, you'll see curses in there that if the Israelites don't follow Yahweh's covenant commands, they're going to be punished with curses, rightfully so. And their claim is, the Hebrew Israelites is, listen, only one people fulfill these curses that have happened to them. And it's us. Just look at what happened with the diaspora, the transatlantic slave trade out of Africa, and you see this people group treated this way and fulfilling all these curses, and they'll take a person through Deuteronomy 28 and say, look at this, look at this, look at this. You know, your sons and daughters will be given to other nations, and you know, you won't be able to grow stuff. You'll always be sick. Uh, you'll be enslaved in bonds. You'll be a byword. You know, all these kinds of things everyone's going to be against you you're going to be the lowest in society always borrowing all these types of things and they'll say look this this is the so-called african-american in america guess what they're not really african-americans they're hebrew <laughs> israelites and so they believe you need to wake up to your identity is that a good synopsis so far to give people an idea of this yeah, I, I think so. That's that's very good. So why do you think it's growing? I know uh, you talked a little bit about that, but why do you think it's growing? Because we're telling everyone it's growing. Just trust us. It's growing like crazy. Why do you think it's growing? 
Yeah, oftentimes we see, um, when, when you look at African-American religion, um, almost every one of them are addressing the issue of uh, African-American degradation. Uh, and so you will see that during times of racial tensions, or at least explicit racial tensions, uh, you will see this drawing towards these people who are given these answers. Um, and the sad part about it, though, is that oftentimes the church has dropped the ball on this issue. And therefore, you'll have these other voices coming coming up and speaking to these issues, and people are drawn to this. So like you said, in the past five years, we all understand that we've been seeing some more explicit tensions in American culture. And I believe that's the result, or excuse me, I believe the attraction of the uh, Hebrew Israelite movement is the result of that. So, um, We've seen an increase in tensions between ethnic groups in the city. I mean, just turn on the news, just look at all the stuff going on, especially lately. And you yeah. see a breakdown in a lot of ways of what's historically been the backbone of you know black uh, neighborhoods and communities, which is what historically black church. You see that breaking down, and it's just chaos. And the Hebrew Israelites are one of the groups to say, hey, we've got the answer. First of all, the answer is, guess what? You don't even know who you are. You're a biological descendant of the ancient Hebrews, so you should be proud people, number one. Number two, the way you can get saved and made right with God is by obeying the law of Moses. Because it's meant for us. We just need to keep the law. And that's the solution to the ghetto, is obeying the law of Moses. Well, that's what we're going to talk about when we come back here, talking to Jimmy Butts about his article in the most recent edition coming out of the Christian Research Journal about the Black Hebrew Israelite movement. We're going to ask, is it true that a person can be made right with God by obeying the law of Moses? Other side, don't go anywhere. This is Vocab Malone. I'm filling in for Tom Brown, your favorite host on your favorite radio station, 1360, with your favorite show called Koinonia Radio. Today we're discussing something incredibly interesting, very rare to hear it discussed on the radio, but it needs to be discussed. It's a new religious group that is becoming dominant in our inner cities, and you've probably never even heard of it sometimes called the Hebrew Israelite movement. Today we're speaking with an author who's written an article on them, a great introductory article to these issues. His name is Jimmy Butts. We've been talking to him. He's hanging out there in Louisville. And the article deals with the origin and history of this group, this movement, and their theology. And today that's what we want to ask here on Quinonia Radio, because what we want to tell people is that uh, the theology of this movement, um, it poses an answer, but the answer is ultimately destructive towards the ends of true community and unity, and it's also destructive towards the end of the gospel, because the gospel of Jesus is the central and foundational message of Christianity. And it's deep, but it has to do with sinners who need to be made right with a pure and perfect God. And they have been made right through Jesus Christ, if indeed they have been made right. For Jesus Christ, the second person of the triune God, took on flesh, died for the sins of sinners as a substitution, as a, an atonement for sin, paid the price not pay, kept the law perfectly, and now he saves all those who are connected by faith, by trusting in him, he saves them permanently. They are saved, they are his, they are adopted in, they are made right with God. It is as if they had never sinned, and is and all sin is forgiven, and it is as if they had kept the law perfectly as well, because Jesus did, and we're in union with him as Christians. And so, we see the law for what it is, but we don't look at look at it to justify us. For example, Galatians 2.16 says, By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Jimmy, how would you define justified? How would you define justified there in Galatians 2.16? Well, I think uh, what 
Paul is trying to show us is that uh, justification uh, is a work of God and it's something that we can't do ourselves. So I would explain justification as being made right with God, being in right standing with a holy and righteous God. Right. And that uh, really has to do with um, the root there. In Greek, you can see it as well. Now, the Hebrew Israelite doctrine of salvation, how would you define it? Because, you know, the idea that some uh, or many or most, you know, black folks living in America and in the Western Hemisphere are actually Israelites, it may be largely historically mistaken and genealogically mistaken, but it's not sinful necessarily. You could just be wrong about that. That's no big deal. In a sense, in a sense, don't get me wrong now, but there's a bigger issue at stake. What's the bigger issue at stake when it comes to Hebrew Israelite and what they teach? Yes, well... <clears throat> Paul highlights also in the book of Galatians and also in the book of Romans that it's by faith alone that we are justified with God. And therefore, anytime someone attempts to add another requirement, uh, they have basically nullified uh, the gospel. And this is what we run into when it comes to uh, the black Hebrew, excuse me, the Hebrew Israelites. Uh, some on one hand place um, a great premium on law keeping, saying that you know we must obey the law uh, in order to be found right with God. But also they look to their ethnicity as a means of, of justification or a means of, of right standing with God. And so just because they come from a particular ethnic group, they're automatically uh, God's people. But then they do think that we need to keep the law. Uh, let's Now, what does it look like to keep the law? In, in a Hebrew Israelite's mind, if they say you need to keep the law to be made right with God, what does that look like to them? Well, oftentimes you'll see them uh, in discussions with people. Like even, I think I even saw uh, one that you did where... Uh, they will question you on like things like your beard, uh, on things like uh, some of the things that you may wear on your body because some of the Levitical laws that uh, uh, say that, you know, you can't do certain things, you can't eat certain things. And so it's, it's pretty much the uh, strict adherence to that law that, you know, that they, they look to as being right with God. That, that's what you have to do. I'm going to read a book. This is actually a Hebrew Israelite book. It's not from the article, but I do encourage everyone to go check out this article. You can buy it from the Christian Research Journal. Subscribe there on uh, my radio show's website, urbantheologianradio.com, and uh, you'll find this article about the origin and insufficiency of the black Hebrew Israelite movement. But I have a book here written by a Hebrew Israelite. It's called The Word, The Israelites, and The Damned, edited by Shadrach. And um, this is a group out of Canada. It's printed in 1993. There's a section here starting on page 99 called, called Who's Under Grace? I'm going to read a section of this. It's going to be a little confusing, but I'm going to give you a flavor of their soteriology. That's the big word of the day, ladies and gentlemen. Soteriology. Soteriology means your doctrine or your theology of salvation or your th your beliefs about how a person is saved and what that means. So, soteriology. So, right now we're talking about the soteriological problem of the Hebrew Israelites. You got that, everybody? The soteriological problem. That's right. Here it is on page 115 from a Hebrew Israelite book, and here's where the quote begins. What we must see among all these scriptures is that God means the God of Israel, whether you are under faith, grace, or law. That's an interesting thing right there in itself. They believe, depending on your ethnicity, you're either under faith, grace, or law. Because this group does believe Gentiles can be saved. Not all of them do, but this particular group does. And they view Gentiles as non-black or brown nations, basically. Quote, If you are going to come to God, it has to be through the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you are an Israelite, you must come. Keep the law. Others who are not would have to follow you. Then they too shall be saved. Grace and faith comes through one channel, and that is 
in the law. Some would have to keep the law. Some would have to believe in the law that others are doing, and some would have to turn to those doing the law to be saved. What does it say in the last days? And they shall hold on the skirt of those who are Jews, and say, We will come with you, because we have heard that God is with you. Okay, what is being said there, I can reread some of it if you want me to, Jimmy, just let me know, is that you, if you're an Israelite, so if you're black, Hispanic, or Native American, they believe those are the lost tribes of Israel here, that you've got to keep the law to be saved. But if you're a Gentile, so that's like uh, if you're Asian, if you're Arabic, if you're uh, white, if you're something like that, then you don't keep the law, but you follow those who do, and so you receive your salvation sort of by, quote, clinging to an Israelite, so kind of being under them as a mediator. You don't come directly to God. You have to come through an actual Israelite, basically. And notice this key phrase, grace and faith comes through one channel, and that is in the law. I think that's an interesting phrase. Now, it's a little bit confusing. Don't get me wrong. I think so. But uh, notice, can anyone keep the law? Jimmy, can anyone keep the law? Is that possible? Well, it's funny you ask that. I'm looking here at Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 10. It says, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, curses everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So what does that mean? What does that mean? So essentially what it's saying is that If you want to be justified by the law, that means from birth, you would have to have never broken the law. And any parents out there, um, I'm pretty sure, would testify to the fact that uh, we're born in sin. Yeah, my kids are all little lawbreakers, no doubt. (laughs) Exactly. Now, is there anyone who has ever kept the law completely? Absolutely. It's it's one person who has kept the law for us, and namely Jesus Christ. Uh, And so he's the only uh, perfectly righteous one, and and it's only through him that we can obtain salvation. All right. So let's do this. From time to time, I like to do a reset, and that's just where we kind of recap what we've done, and then go into some more depth so let's just if everyone uh, is listening i want to review what we've done because i know this is new to a lot of you but listen if you don't think it's important i want you to stop for a second because you live in arizona if you're hearing this most of you and i want you to do a little experiment where was mormonism founded (laughs) the answer is new york basically way, way out there way i mean can you get farther away from arizona than new york i mean you can but you know what i'm saying it's in the 1800s, right? 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, okay. Here we are, it's 2016. If I go over to Mesa, I'm going to see a giant, massive structure there. Mormon Temple. And that's not the only one around. I'm going to see a bunch all throughout Arizona. I'm going to see whole communities. And Now, how, how did it get to be that way? How did Mormonism grow to be 12 to 14, 15 million people? How did that happen? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but I'll tell you one thing. It wasn't nipped in the bud. At one time, it was also a small religious movement. And now here it is, a global worldwide phenomenon. And it's affecting lives of people. And uh, I'm not saying Mormons are mean, but I am telling you that it's false doctrine, what they teach. And it's leading people astray. Well, the Hebrew Israelite right now, yeah, it's small, but it's growing. So we do need to talk about this and discuss this. And there's an article in the the Christian Research Journal, Journal written by today's guest named Jimmy Butts called The Origin and Insufficiency of the Black Hebrews Light Movement. We've been discussing the history of this this group and uh, some of their claims and some of the soteriological problems. So how would you summarize in a minute what we've covered so far, Jimmy, before we move on to the next thing in our next section? Yeah, so basically that when you think about the Hebrew Israelite movement, uh, we can trace uh, back through African American history this connection, the symbolic connection that they've had uh, with the story of Moses and the Exodus, and, and up until a time where some actually claim uh, literal 
a connection with the ancient Hebrew Israelites. And so now they are entering in local communities and they are spreading a gospel of the law. Right. You must obey the law to be saved. And it's not true because God offers salvation, not because of your identity ethnically, because of your identity in Christ. And he offers this not through law keeping, as if that was possible, but through <laughs> faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3, 4 through 9. When we come back, we've got one more segment. Jimmy, do you think we have time today to talk about the DNA or genetic evidence or lack thereof in in relationship to this claim about black Americans being Hebrew Israelites, what do you think? Can we do it? I'm all for it. All right, when we come back, we're going to ask, because this is a claim about genealogy, what's the genealogical evidence? Don't go anywhere. Hey, 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 hey. This is Quinnity Radio. You are listening to 1360 KPXQ Faith Talk. Have you been to the website... I hope you've been to the website. It's pretty easy to find. You know, nowadays, you don't even have to know the address of a website. You can just kind of put in keywords, and usually the website will be the first thing that pops up. So, you know, I go put in 1360 Faith Talk. And guess what? faithtalk1360.com pops up. And guess what? You can listen live to this show, or any show for that matter, even if you're not in your car, even if you are just got your laptop there. You know? Check it out. We're also podcasting, meaning this show can be downloaded after it's recorded. And to get that, you go to SoundCloud. Just go to SoundCloud.com and you can kind of poke around a little bit. But if you know how to spell Quinn and E, I put that in there. If not, put in Tom Brown, you know, radio. Put in even Vocab Malone radio. Eh? At least you'll see the shows I'm on. <laughs> but uh, we are talking today on Quinn and Ear Radio because it's about community. And we've been talking about a, a, a religious movement that's relatively new that we think is destructive towards community. Not just towards the black community, which we've kind of been focusing on, but towards Christian community and even larger community than that in, in many ways. It offers a solution. It says, here's a place to find true community, but... We think that's a false promise, and they're called the Hebrew Israelites, sometimes called the Black Hebrew Israelites, and we've been discussing an article that appears in the Christian Research Journal, which you can subscribe to, and they're not paying us or anything, we just, I just think it's a good magazine I want you to, to get with. Uh, you can just subscribe there at Maya Radio Show's website, urbantheologianradio.com, and the article's called The Origin and Insufficiency of the Black Hebrew Israelite Movement. I am speaking to the author today named Jimmy Butts. He holds an A.B. in Bible and a B.A. in Christian ministry. He's ministered to folks in these different religious groups in a a kind of black community context for the past 10 years. Right now he's completing an MDiv in Islamic Studies. Welcome back to Quinity Radio. Jimmy Butts, how you doing, man? Thank you, man. Glad to be here. All right, let's discuss the DNA. Now, again, let's do a brief recap. Why is it important when we discuss this specific religious group? Why is it important for you and I, or anyone interested in this specific religious group, the Hebrew Israelites, to discuss and talk about DNA or genetic evidence? Why is that even relevant? To help everyone understand why that even matters in relationship to this movement. Why? Well, because of the claims that the movement is making, uh, they're claiming to be the literal descendants of the ancient Israelites. And therefore, uh, if evidence can be shown to the otherwise, uh, we should know about it. Let's um, let's recap this too. Why, in the Hebrew Israelites' mind, is it important for them to know that they're actually not African American, that they're actually Hebrew Israelites? Why do they even think that's important in the first place? Well, because it makes a distinction between those who are amongst the people of God and those who are outsiders. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's important to be connected with Israel because that has a lot to do with their soteriology. All right, so what do they believe about your ethnicity in relationship to how you are saved? What do they believe yeah. about that? What's the basis? Yeah, yeah. Um, Oftentimes, they say that 
and, and as you've already noted, that different groups believe different things. Some believe that if you don't fall from the line of uh, the, the lost tribe, so-called, then you're not saved and, and you, you can't even be a part of the kingdom. Uh, but others believe that you can. And so uh, ethnicity, ethnicity is, is very important because it would it would. Uh, refer a person to what they need to do next in order to be saved. And what do they say after a person realizes they're they're actually an Israelite, not not a Native American or a Hispanic or a Black American? What do they usually say you need to do next after that? You need to adhere to the law. All right. And that's why we've quoted a lot today from Galatians, because, guys, whenever you encounter any group that really emphasizes the idea of keeping the law as a means for salvation, which is an anti-gospel notion. I mean, if, if you get saved from keeping the law, why you got to come down here, Jesus, and die for? You know? He, why you got to do all that? We just, just help us keep the law. But the fact is, we can't keep the law. It was never designed to save us. And... um it's not even possible anyway. And Galatians is perfect. It's just what the doctor ordered when you see these types of claims. Just going through and reading God's Word and realizing that it is as if the Holy Spirit anticipated we would encounter groups like the Hebrew Israelites when Galatians was written. And it deals with every issue relevant to this. Not just the law-keeping, but the issues of Jew and Gentile. Because remember, the average Hebrew Israelite believes they would be the true Jews and everybody else are Gentiles, basically. So it has all that wrapped in, in one book. It's beautiful. And so that's why it's important. We want to say, well, is there any evidence to this claim that, hey, if you're over here and you were brought on a ship, that you're actually probably from the lost tribes of Israel, which have now been, you know, uh, re recovered basically they believe that's why we want to ask what's the genetic evidence so talk a little about some of the genetic evidence or lack thereof that you've uncovered in your research Jimmy Butts article of this author we're discussing or artic, author of the article we're discussing or maybe some things that you didn't even get to include in the article that maybe you wish you could have included but let's talk a little about that DNA evidence what do you want to say on that yeah absolutely um, well when we look at uh, scholars uh, deciding to to investigate these claims. Uh, actually, we uncover some some very interesting things. So um, we see in the genetic research that there was a group in Zimbabwe uh, called the Limba tribe mm -hmm. uh, who actually have uh, genetic lineage or, or verification that they are um, descendants of the Israelites. Uh, but this in no way shows that all African Americans are Israelites. Only if you were to descend from the Limba tribe, would you could you make that claim? Uh, they they've had other uh, proof peoples uh, from groups in Africa like the Falashas, uh, who. Uh, have been shown that they, they don't trace back genetically to the ancient Israelites. So the so, Falashas, let's let's catch everyone up to speed a little bit on that. The Falashas generally are hailing from Ethiopia, mm -hmm. and sometimes they're, they, people call them things like black Jews or Ethiopian Jews or something like that. But the Falashas there in Ethiopia uh, do you know, embrace Judaism basically as a religion. And the earliest Hebrews like movement said, look, here's evidence. Look at the flashes of Ethiopia. But was there a biological connection to the ancient biblical Israelites with the flashes or not? No. Uh, they, they claim uh, from the uh, Ethiopian chronicles uh, that King Solomon uh, and the Queen of Sheba got together and had a son by the name of Menelik. All right, let's stop and there for just a second. So the Queen of Sheba, everybody, if you remember, she did come to visit King Solomon. You guys remember what she said? Oh, man, the half has not been told. Like, <laughs> she was tripping out like, Solomon, you got it going on, you know. <laughs> so that's, that's true right there. That happened. The Bible recounts that. But then there's a myth, and recount the myth one more time. And let's see how this ties in. What's the myth that arose about the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon? Well, uh, the myth is that they 
actually had sexual relations and they had a son by the name of Menelik mm-hmm. and he became the first uh, king of Ethiopia. Okay. Now why is yeah. that why is that important in Ethiopian history and in relationship to what we're talking about today? Help us help everyone to tie it, kind of tie it together. Well, because that's the link that they claim that links them to the Israelites. Right. right. If that story is true, then there is veracity in the statement that they descend from the uh, ancient Israelites. You know, that whole thing, it's interesting because even if that was the case, let's just say that they had a son, which the genetic evidence seems to say they, they didn't. Uh, you would have a, someone who would be half Jewish, I would imagine, there, you know, yeah. <laughs> Solomon on his dad's side. And then who is he going to be um, mating with, as it were, when he goes back to Ethiopia? They would be Ethiopians, right? So mm-hmm. not, not folks who are Israelites. And, I mean, you know, I don't know how many women he could get pregnant. I mean, I don't think he had the 1,000 wives thing going on that <laughs> Solomon had. But, you know, he might have had, you know, a couple here and there. Uh, let's just say he, he had 20 sons. I mean, I'm just throwing out numbers. I don't know the – I mean, but the, then you're talking not halves anymore. You're talking down to, to a lesser extent even because, remember, he would be half Israelite. And then you'd have to go further, further. My point is, like, that starts to get really thin genetically. Genetically, even if that was a, a big thing. But the DNA evidence basically seems to point that the Falashas of Ethiopia are more likely... Uh, it's more it's more accurate to describe them as converts to Judaism as a religion as opposed to actually biological Israelites. Isn't that correct? Absolutely, yes. Exactly Not the right. case, though, with the Limba. Let's zoom back in on the Limba. Uh, what are maybe some? Uh, you got some books there in your notes. Let's talk about the limba one more time. Maybe read some of the parts from your article. I got it in front of me. If you want me to read it um, about the limba, because it is eye opening to say, well, wait a minute. There's a little bit of truth to some of these claims. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, when geneticists uh, heard about the the limba tribe and they did their genetic testing, actually, what they found is that. I think it was about 50% of uh, their wow. their genes traced mm-hmm. back to Israelite heritage, and yeah. the other 50 or so was Negroid. Yeah, 50% Y chromosomes were Semitic in origin, and that's these are from real geneticists. For example, Treffer Jenkins, as well as a scholar with the last name of Parfit, who's written extensively on this, such as a book called, um, let me see, Black Jews in Africa and the Americas. So that means the diaspora, that's where the children of Israel, the Israelites, really were scattered throughout the world. And that includes Africa, at least parts of it. But does that prove the Hebrew Israelites' case? If not, why not? We only got a few minutes left. Yeah, so, well, quickly, the What we find, if you look at history, is that in the transatlantic slave trade, uh, the enslavers were taking Africans of all different ethnic groups. Right. Um, And so even if the Limba, well, even though the Limba are uh, genetically Israelite, um, only if all African-Americans go back to the Limba tribe, will it be accurate to say that we're all Israelites? And that's not the case because you have the Ashanti, the Watusi, the Mandingo, and others. And they're mainly from the west coast of Africa as well. I don't even know if they generally went into Zimbabwe, but nonetheless, it's interesting to trace these things down. When we come back, we've only got a few minutes left. We're going to talk one more time about the heart of the issue when it comes to this religious group called the Hebrew Israelites. This is Quinnity Radio. You've been chilling in the cut this afternoon with Vocab Malone. I'm a guest host filling in for the illustrious Tom Brown. And uh, I do a show called Urban Theologian Radio, which I encourage you to go to the website and subscribe to the Christian Research Journal. Why do I say that? There's a great article in there 
talking about a new religious movement taking America's cities by storm, the Hebrew Israelites. The name of the article is The Origin and Insufficiency of the Black Hebrew Israelite Movement by Jimmy Butts. We've got an inside seat because the article is not even out yet, and yet we're talking to the author. So I want to ask him a final question. What is the heart of the issue for the Christian when it comes to the Hebrew Israelite movement? What is it? Yeah, well, if you look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 2, Paul says, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. And so the idea that we can obtain salvation through the law disqualifies us from salvation. And, and so the heart of the matter is eternal salvation. Um, the Hebrew Israelites turn people away from uh, the method that God has chosen to, to save us. So there's not a focus on Christ as Savior, as there should be anymore within the Hebrew Israelite schema. But instead, really, there's a big focus on keeping the law and your identity, not in Christ as it should be, but your identity according to your ethnic affiliation. In this case, as we've shown genetically, at least we talked a little bit about in the last segment, their identification as Hebrew Israelites is not even... Uh, not even true. It's uh, it's mainly false. So it's built upon a false premise in the first place. But nonetheless, we don't turn to law, we turn to Christ. So Jimmy, thanks for joining us today on Coin and E Radio. The article is good. I hope the people get it. And I pray that the Lord uses it mightily. Thank you. Thank you, brother. All right. Well, this has been another episode of Quinn and Your Radio on 1360 Faith Talk KPXQ. My name is Vo Cavalone. Been filling in for Tom Brown today. So shine, go